so very, very happy to be here uh, because all of you are here. So let me get started. First, I want to tell you uh, how to get to Loughborough University because nobody knows, <laughs> nobody knows where it is. I just put it into Google Maps, <laughs> and this is what came up. So you're going to drive from San Diego, I guess, to Seattle. Uh, you have to take some um, boats. Um, you can stop in uh, Japan, and then you have to cross all that territory where Neanderthals and others used to live. And eventually, you'll get to Loughborough, which is 20 miles south of uh, Nottingham. But obviously, it is the center of the universe. There's a little place called London there. And here's just a shot of what Loughborough University looks like. Uh, I'm obviously not from Loughborough. I grew up in Philadelphia. And we've, we've been living there for six years now. If, if I could pronounce it correctly, I would say Loughborough. Loughborough. OK. So our ancestors of 30,000 years ago were about this tall. And we're about that tall today as well, at least people in the rich countries, like uh, this Australian, five foot 10 and a half. Five foot ten and a half. By 5,000 um, or 7,000 years ago, with agriculture, heights begin to drop. And then Roman soldiers, even shorter, middle aged peasants, as Clark Larson was saying, even worse uh, health. And we're using height here as an indication of population health. When the entire height of a population changes going down, that's an indication that there is worse nutrition more infection, all those problems that Clark Larson just talked about. Some people have recovered in the uh, 20th and 21st century in the rich nations. But not all people have recovered. My uh, title is Globalization. And I, f I find these things you know, on Google Images. You can search for them as well. So here, here we have one view of the world today which has become globalized by uh, multinational corporations. One definition of globalization is the process of international integration of economies, but more than economies, of whole ways of thinking and behaving. That international integration arising from the interchange of worldviews, products, and ideas. And as you can see from this map, very often it's worldviews, products, and ideas that come from one particular part of the world, the rich world, that are imposed on the rest of the world. My talk today, I also want to get into the meaning that food has for people. Food has tremendous meaning that goes beyond just filling our bellies and uh, providing our nutritional requirements. We've just celebrated one meaningful event at least in this part of the world, Thanksgiving. So this Norman Rockwell uh, painting, the image of it, uh, uh, conveys a great deal of meaning. Here's another kind of meaning. I picked uh, this because this is Jimmy Smith, the greatest jazz organist that has ever lived. But he's, this is a, an album from the 1950s, the incredible Jimmy Smith home cooking. He's standing in front of a kind of soul food restaurant, food served at all times. But of course, the images are drink Coca-Cola, drink Coca-Cola. Some seven up, but drink Coca-Cola. If there are any litigators here from the Coca-Cola Corporation, please see me after my talk. <laughs> I'll buy you Pepsi, and we'll uh, sort things out. I am going to pick on Coca-Cola, but they deserve it. So that, that meaning, you know, it was in World War II that the Coca-Cola Corporation and the US military worked together to create a home feeling for our troops overseas. And that's still going on today in arenas of uh, warfare where US and UK troops are uh, fighting. So we have globalization all over the world today. But I'm going to focus on one place, and that's Mexico. We have a project in uh, the Yucatan of Mexico that is looking at some of the effects of globalization on children's diets. So here's Cozumel and Playa del Carmen and Cancun, and I'm sure you're familiar with those sorts of places. We're working over here in the capital of Yucatan. Yucatan is this state of Mexico here. Uh, Merida, a city of about one million people uh, today. And if you arrive in Merida, you'll see friendly police officers directing traffic. And there's Burger King, and there's Walmart, and uh, every other major US and many European corporations as well. You can find a few 
uh, trinkets to buy as well. We're working specifically with the Maya people of Yucatan. The Maya culture area includes uh, southern Mexico, uh, Guatemala, parts of Belize, and a little bit of El Salvador and Honduras. The Maya today, today, number seven to eight million people. They are the largest Native American ethnic group. But they are also the shortest Native American ethnic group. They have the highest level of what we call stunting, which is very low height for age when we're measuring children. So these are, this is a, a house in, in a, the Maya neighborhood we work in. That's a stone wall and a house with uh, uh, just fabric covering the front of the house. Not all of them are this uh, impoverished. The Maya traditionally sleep on hammocks, do their homework on hammocks, uh, watch television on hammocks. Uh, I like hammocks. Uh, the school children are provided with some uh, food, but they also get these snacks. This gentleman shows up in this vehicle and he gives them snacks. Some are traditional foods that Maya have eaten for hundreds of years, and some are globalized snacks that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, here's uh, a grandmother and her grandchild. You'll see her again later. And here's uh, one of the children. Uh, those little um, bandage-looking things on their finger are actually uh, electrode pickups. We, in one of our studies, we uh, put a device on the children that measured their heart rates and physical activity to see if they were uh, getting enough or not enough physical activity. This is a picture um, my wife took. Uh, you'll see her in a minute, just the children playing in this abandoned Coca-Cola kiosk. Uh, some of our colleagues, um, Alan Goodman and Thomas Leatherman, have written articles about the coca colonization of the Yucatan. It, it is, it's, it's not the, the uh, drug coke, uh, the, the white powder, but the uh, stuff in bottles, which is just as much a drug, of course. So it, the, the Coca-Cola symbols are ubiquitous these symbols of, of, of uh, coca colonization. This is a traditional Maya dance, which is being performed for locals and tourists. Um, and those trays come from Coca-Cola Corporation. Uh, and there's Coca-Colas on there, not traditional Maya foods, but they're doing a traditional Maya dance. So you have this uh, syncretism between the ancient Maya, uh, you know, who are uh, some people uh, say they predict the end of the world in just a couple of weeks, but uh, uh, I, I would still send out my Christmas cards. Uh, the world, I don't think, will end on December 21st. And the Maya never believed that either, by the way. But um, a way of life is certainly changing because of the influx of these products from uh, the rich countries. These are Maya men who have just finished a traditional uh, game, the ball game that the Maya played. And um, they're recreating a ball game, but they're you know, taking the pause that refreshes with Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. And uh, notice their bellies. Fox News Latino says Mexico leads the world in consumption of sugary drinks. Mexico is the biggest cons consumer of soft drinks in the world. 40% greater than the United States. Come on, people, you have to do your job and start drinking more fizzy drinks. 43 gallons per person in Mexico, only 31 in the United States. Well, seven out of 10 Mexicans are overweight, according to United Nations surveys. Diabetes is Mexico's number one killer, taking 70,000 lives a year, more than the gangster violence that we hear so much about near the Mexican-US border. This is Dr. Inej Silva, the principal investigator of our project in Merida, and also my wife. Uh, this is the grandmother you saw before, and this is one of the children in our study. We're looking, in the first study that I'll talk about today, we, we looked at mothers and children. And we have a new study with grandmothers, mothers, and children as well. Well, what's going on here? Uh, Dr. Varela Silva is five foot one inches tall. She comes up my shoulder. The grandmother is four feet eight inches tall. And for an adult woman, that's evidence that she was malnourished when she was growing up. And the child will just say that she is too short for her age. So we have this problem of very short stature. Have the Maya always been this short? Men today average about five 
foot three inches tall, these Maya men, uh, probably from Guatemala. Uh, but archaeological records, like uh, we've been hearing about in the last few talks, uh, show that uh, Maya averaged about five foot six inches tall with some of the very high status Maya, the priest kings, the ones buried under the big pyramids at Palenque and Tikal up to five foot ten inches tall. That's common today as well, that the very rich are tall. Well, the Maya have a lot of meaning in the foods they eat. The Maya story of creation is a story of people being created by the divine grandmother of the gods, Shmukane, grinding white and yellow corn nine times, mixing it with water, and from this grease she created fat from the masa, the mixture of, of corn meal itself created the muscle and the bone, and uh, from this the Maya people were born. Maya are people of the corn. This is a contemporary uh, uh, mural in southern Mexico, and you see people coming out of the corn. And they lived by agriculture and by corn during the height of their state uh, society, from 250 AD to about 900 AD. Then Spanish arrived with their steel and their germs, and of course, uh, Maya society was never quite the same. Here are people today making tortillas on the coben, this metal tray over the fire, taking the masa, which is a mixture of corn and um, ash, and limestone, which has been boiled. That processing of the corn enhances its nutritional quality. The Maya never suffered from some of the B vitamin diseases that uh, Clark Larson mentioned because by boiling, by processing the corn um, with a little bit of limestone, they enhance the uh, uh, niacin content, which prevents the disease called pellagra. But when Europeans just took the corn to Europe and didn't process it, pellagra killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people in southern Europe and the south of the United States. So the Maya knew what they were doing. What's happening today in Mexico? This is international trade in Mexico. These data come from the Mexican government. These are the official figures. The orange is imports. The blue is exports. Between 2006, 2011, even today, Mexico is a net importer. Its main export is powdered cocoa with added sugar, you know, to make chocolate milk and things like that. Mexico is the third major um, consumer in the Americas. The United States and Canada are one and two. The most consumed foods in Mexico are bread and tortillas, and it's becoming in that order. Tortillas are taking a second place, and we'll see what that, that does to people. Mexican processed food consumption is expected to grow at an average rate of 6.1%. So it's only going to get worse. So Mexican is, Mexico is definitely an, a, a, a country taking the globalization, not giving it. The success stories, according to the Mexican government, are investments by Ferraro Rocher chocolates. I like them, but they're not particularly nutritious in a balanced diet. And Nestle beverages. Nestle is a Swiss company dominating the beverage market, competing with Coke and Pepsi and others, not just for uh, sweet fizzy drinks, but as nutritional supplements. Why do we need nutritional supplements? Why, why, why do all these companies, Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle, want to improve our health by buy, buying their products? Well, it's because we've switched from tr traditional foods. Mexicans, and Maya in particular, ate corn, processed corn products. The most ubiquitous were tortillas. Tortillas have lots of energy, protein, and fiber, and all these essential nutrients, which if you lack one of these essential nutrients, you will not grow very well. What's replacing them? Sweetbreads or pan dulce. I'm sure you can buy these around here. They are the more desired food. They taste better. And even replacing that is, of course, sliced white bread, Pam Bimbo. Bimbo might be buying Hostess Corporation, which just went bankrupt, the maker of Twinkies. Bimbo is taking over their global domination. And how are they selling it? This is in Guatemala. This is the biggest temple at Tikal. They're saying this is bread for Guatemala. This should replace those tortillas. 
Well, what's in this stuff? Tortillas I have over here, and here's a whole slew of uh, nutrients. I have in the green here using a traffic light system. Green is good. Tortillas have more fiber than anything else. You can see that the sweetbreads without fat or the sweetbreads with fat, lots of calories, some protein, but way too much fat, not enough fiber, not enough folic acid, not enough calcium, in fact, zero if you use unenriched flour. Pan Bimbo has these things because, uh, like Wonder Bread, they add back some of the nutrients that they mill out of the flour when it's processed, but not all of the nutrients. So overall, it's the tortilla that's all in the green. You'd be better off eating tortillas for a balanced diet. But Mexicans, and especially poor Mexicans, are switching away from tortillas. The Mexican National Health Survey of 2006, and I don't have data for the youngest uh, children, but for 12 to 19 year olds, energy intake in boys was about 1,900 kilocalories a day. For girls, only 1,600 on average. That's about 77% of their needs. So they're not getting even enough energy. But especially what the Mexican National Health and Nutrition Survey reported was in the southern region, that's Yucatan. And in the lower socioeconomic status, that's the impoverished Maya, they have the lowest intakes of all nutrients, especially vitamin A, folates, iron, zinc, and calcium. So they cannot grow well in height. They're not getting enough total energy, but what they do get, which stays in their body, gets turned to fat. So the net result is sh very short stature, but increasing overweight in adults and in children and this is called the nutritional dual burden of being both way too short and also overweight. It's the worst possible predictor of health outcomes. So what's happening in globalization and children's nutrition? I found this image on a globalization website that talked about good globalization. And this is supposedly a good image. We're all in it together. But I see this as all these hands from other countries holding up our way of life not supporting their way of life, which is all covered up down here. I want to thank the team of people that uh, are involved in these studies, including our Mexican colleagues, uh, Federico Dickinson and, and the others are in Merida, as well as academic faculty and graduate students. Uh, if you want to find out more about our work, go to this website, mayaproject.org.uk. We have a photographic art and science exhibit going on right now in Lisbon, Portugal. And here is the website where you can see those photographs, mayaproject.org.uk. And I want to thank all the supporters of our project, Sinvestav in Merida, uh, the Santander Banks have helped us, the Wenner Gren Foundation, uh, thank you Leslie, has funded uh, our, the research I showed today, and of course everybody here today. Thank you.